Oh, I'm sorry for that. Is that who is that? Is that Dale? I missed. Him. Yeah. Um. I I'm just really sad. My um. Meeting is being recorded. My um. My um. Uh, dog died today. I already hear that, Dale. Uh, yeah. I'm so I, it, sorry. Oh my God, smash me. You enjoy that corn dog? Hmm? Mm. Gabe, you have one minute to go on video. Otherwise, I'm going to remove you from the uh, chat. <laughs> Gabe, there's disruptive. Sorry about that one. Sorry, sorry. Gabe, Gabe, you need to go on video if you want to stay in the chat. Hot camera, bro. A visitor. It's a troll. Gabe, I wish you all the best. If you want some some help having a happier life, um, feel free to reach out on. Hot uh, cameras, bro. Feel free to reach out one on one, um, but you're not going to be able to remain in the chat unless you uh, go on video. I'm sorry. So they were playing disruptive sounds and clearly a troll. So. Yep. I really hope. I really hope he can. He can. <laughs> I really hope he can just improve his. Oh my goodness. Future. Garrett, hello. How are you doing? Hi, hi daughter. You me, I just try interrupted. <laughs> hi, hi, Liam. Sorry about that, Liam. Jenny got gets excited when she sees my daughters. Uh, I know. Nope. So sorry. Nope, so it's so sorry. Nope, it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. I get excited when I see my daughters too. They're pretty cute. <laughs> they are. Yeah, um, I got excited when I saw my dog, but um. Oh, I saw it dead this morning. You saw it in what a step her, bed. What is her name? What's your name? What is your name, daughter? Dog. Huh? <laughs> She's melting away at shyness. She doesn't usually get shy, but maybe she realizes it's a big group. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, we're just uh, doing some introductions. So if anyone wants to introduce themselves, where they're from, a leadership quality they like, or what yes. draws you tonight. Can I introduce myself? Yes, please. Go ahead. And um, My name is Dale Sweden, and I'm from, uh, I'm from Kentucky. Um, I lived there my whole entire life. Are you chicken? Please go on mute if you're not talking so we can remove the trolls. What is this? Yep, great idea. Okay. We can see his face. And uh, I will make some codes so that we have multiple people troll hunting. Hello, Garrett. Hi, how are you, Susan? Uh, yeah, good, yeah. Oh, good to see your daughter. Hello. <laughs> Hello, beautiful. <laughs> so if anyone wants to introduce themselves and say uh, a leadership <laughs> quality of uh, that they they like or appreciate. May I please, uh, may I please? Yeah, go ahead, may I please introduce? Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, so my name's Liam Wen, I'm from Kentucky. Uh, I know this might sound like stereotypical, but like I actually like, really like Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's my favorite like restaurant. Not really restaurant fast food. That might sound like stereotypical, but I don't know. I actually do really like it. I just wanted to share that for the group chat. And I wish everyone the best of luck in life. Liam, can you go on video? 
Hey, uh, I'm really sorry. My laptop is like really old. Uh, when I moved to Kentucky, I brought it and the camera like unfortunately broke. That's is there the any second, way I can like? That's the is second there any person way? saying unusual things for the broken camera. That's unusual. Wait, that's really I'm, unusual. Wait, I'm, I'm really sorry. Like, uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. Huh. I, uh, I, I'll be quiet for the rest of the meeting. Sorry. So I'm just going to venture a guess here and say that um, these two are both trolls. And I used to be a little bit more tolerant. It's not, I used to be a little more tolerant, but um, I, at this point, like everyone being from Kentucky and not having cameras that work is a little too suspicious for me. So um, we'll have to do without. Um, Anyone have the computer background knows that's not true. Your camera doesn't work, okay? So anybody make a cues my computer, my camera doesn't work, you know, that's that's not true. That's a lie. Yeah. Sean, do you want to introduce yourself? And this is my name Sean from Maryland. I, I've been here for a while. Since I think last September or October. I don't know. Uh, today's topic is good. <laughs> I know you're going to like this one, and there's another one upcoming that you're going to like in a few weeks, too. <laughs> what is it? Um, well, uh, when my announcement comes, you'll hear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I see that we have, um, let's see here. Uh, Ginny, did you want to introduce yourself? Benjamin, Burke? Hi, uh, I'm, I'm, hi, I'm Ginny. I'm, I've been, I guess, I've been a regular for quite a while. Um, but tonight I am actually able to speak at the very beginning of the meeting because usually my son is here working from here for about half an hour or so when the meeting starts. So, but he changed his schedule on me so that I'm able to pop in from get-go and be able to be part of the group. Um, I'm in Austin, Texas. Um, and um, I come from showbiz background in New York and uh, but uh, the Ooh. topics that you have chosen for these meetings have been just awesome I must say and then as always it is an extra treat when I get to see Garrett's daughter right Susan hello <laughs> hi Jimmy Susan, did you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Say about yeah. our topic? Yes. My name is Susan. I like to be called Susie, but um, uh, my professional name is Susan. I live in uh, New Jersey, um, near Collinswood. Uh, uh, it's called Hutton Township. And I love going on uh, this uh, Tuesday uh, of the Free Thinker Institute. Uh, I meet some great people, um, um, excellent topics, and that. Um, uh, I I really appreciate uh, um, like uh, connecting with uh, Garrett and uh, Ellie and and the group. Well, thank you so much. May I go? Yes, please. Okay, um, I'm Setemkia, otherwise known as Miss Fawn. Um. I'm living just outside of San Francisco. I grew up doing computers, designing and programming computers. I did that for about 20 years when finally um, an exploded disc in my lumbar region and bipolar disorder kind of side railed me and I changed gender and I've been living as a woman for 30 years and that's been wonderful and it's changed my focus um, at the same time I became very enamored of indigenous uh, beliefs and, and, and ceremonial practices. And I started learning about the various tribes. And while I was volunteering at a hospital, 
turned around one day and stared at this woman and are you my teacher? And she looks back at me and says, well, they told me to expect a new student today. So I guess I am. And in 1999, I met the Kiowa tribal shaman and she adopted me and is my grand, well, is, she's no longer living. Neither of my teachers is living, but I feel really blessed to have been taught, to have been trained by both of them. And I try to touch people in positive ways. As far as leadership goes, I want to see someone who is not so insecure that they cannot hire people who are more intelligent or more creative than themselves. I already told you I'm watching at 645. I'm glad I was at the end of what I was saying. I don't think he realized he wasn't on mute. So yeah, that's that's my story. And as my grandmother would say, and I'm sticking to it. Great. Thanks, Ms. Vaughn. Susan, you have your hand up. You're on mute. Oh, I yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Garrett. Yeah. Um, come on, come on. Uh, I was saying that yeah. because I, yeah, I hear Miss Fond uh, speaking. Um, I was uh, I worked in the um, legal environment, but I was a um, uh, uh, financial uh, a specialist. But uh, I wanted to uh, add on that you know during COVID, you know we uh, during this um, pandemic. Uh, did you, uh, is anybody agree with me that we see a lot of leadership coming out, right? Like a lot of um, uh, leader, good leader coming out and, and take, uh, you know, some of the state. They have really good leader to come out and, and, and take uh, their state to a, a better place. Uh, that's what I noticed. Yes. So thank you. That sounds very positive. Maybe we could talk about uh, some of the good leaders that are coming out as well, or qualities. Uh, yes. Thanks, I think, Ms. I think there's been a big shift in the way the world handles itself. I mean, the, uh, the disruption has caused a uh, reevaluation of globalization. It's uh, uh, caused a, a rethinking of the employer-employee relationship where you can do uh, tasks that you required to do as part of your job. So I think all of those things together have uh, caused a, a shift, but people that are in situations they don't particularly like have been had the courage to step up and say, I don't want this anymore. I want to go to the next level. So I totally agree. It's, it's not necessarily leadership at the top, but it's leadership and in, in people saying, things can be done better. And I, so I'm going to try it and I'm going to show others that uh, that it can be done. Well, I've seen leadership in a different sense. I've seen all kinds of people like on YouTube that really surprised me that um, all of a sudden decided that, well, this is a bad situation and I'm going to do something about it by providing information or entertainment or engagement for people on an ongoing basis. I, I, I've seen people turn their lives around like that. Uh, I mean, my, my, my visibility is through YouTube, but it, it's been amazing. That sounds good. Um, is there anyone else that would like to introduce themselves? We have a few more minutes. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Ben. I'm from uh, Canada. Ben. I'm from uh, Canada. Wait, there's an echo. Hold on. Wait, there's an echo. Hold on. 
Maybe you have more than one device. Maybe on? you have more than one device on. I think I fixed it. I think I fixed it. Okay, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. I think there's still a network here. I am alive. Can I am alive. Can I hear the other people speaking. The other people speaking. Okay, let's go to okay, Harry and then we'll come back. Harry and then we'll come back. Uh, I'm Harry. Uh, I live in uh, Northern Virginia near Dulles Airport outside of Washington, D.C. And um, I'm uh, an American history buff. So the uh, question of presidential leadership qualities is uh, uh, one that I find uh, very interesting. Oh, that's You're wonderful. Oh, that's I think wonderful. Um, I think Anne um, was saying earlier, was saying earlier uh, that she likes politics. Uh, that she likes politics. So hopefully I can get some so ideas from her for ideas from her for and Harry as well. And um, Harry as well. You can call um, sometimes. Sometime. Um, Ellis, um, you, have check, you have two accounts, so maybe check if it's you because Benjamin is um, muted and it, was, it actually stopped echoing when you um, went on mute with one of your accounts, Ellis. So see if your sound is on your second account because that might be causing the echo. Um, so Jane, you go ahead and then I'm going to do a quick demo of Discord um, before we kick off tonight. Sure. Hi, my name's Jane. I'm in Pennsylvania. This is my first meeting here. And as far as leadership, I personally appreciate people that inspire me to go above and beyond. Great. Welcome, Jane. Thank you. Hopefully we'll talk about attributes that sound inspiring to you. And if not, you can add your own inspiring attributes at the end. Um, so I'm going to do, um, I, I had told someone that I would do, uh, we have an online community, which I think um, Ellis posted about um in uh software called discord and um you know we chat throughout the uh throughout the week between these tuesday night events um on discord and so i'm going to do a quick demo of the platform um and uh let me pull up the online community and so i just want to show people how it works because a little demo goes a long way in terms of making it more user friendly and so and this is the software. Um, and um, if you see this little one, that means that I was mentioned in this um, uh, in this channel. Like basically, let me navigate show the navigation on the left side are um, at the top people who have written to me directly. And then below, starting from this play rate one, which is my company, um, there are servers. And on those servers, there are different channels. And so these are the different channels on the uh, the play rate server. So if I click on play rate, um, oh, I'm sorry, if I click on the Freethinker Institute, here are the different channels on the Freethinker Institute server. And um, if there's a little number one, that means someone has mentioned you in that uh, server. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so if I click here, I can see this person mentioned me. Um, and um, and so they were nice enough to remind me to do the little demo that I'm doing now. And then if you click on the ones, uh, you'll see that some of them have bold. Bold means that someone has written since the last time you looked at that channel. Um, these are all called channels. And uh, and so if if something is bold, that means there's something new there to read. And so once you read the new things, then it no longer is bold. You'll see now this is grayed out. And then if you click on, these are called categories. If you click on a category, you'll only see the channels with new information. And so you can very quickly see only the things that you need to be up to speed on in the online community very easily. Um, and then you can see when people are directly messaging you very clearly because it shows up in the upper left hand corner. Um, and so these are some work things that I have to deal with. Um, and I use this uh, software for work as well as for uh, the Freethinker Institute. Um, 
So that's a quick demo of Discord, um, just the the three or four minute demo. Um, so we would love for people to join there and um, you know play around with it. If you go to freethinkerinstitute.org, there's a link to the online community from there as well. Um, we have some people through uh, a partner um, organization called Teacup on my phone, although I'm still trying to navigate whether or not they can hear us. And so Giselle, let me know if you can hear us. Hopefully you can hear other people speaking in addition to me. Um, so with that said, I'm gonna um, sort of uh, stop screen sharing and do a quick intro. Um, so um, first of all, um, my name is Garrett Lang. I should have introduced myself before giving them intro to Discord, but I'm a software developer turned software inventor. I'm gonna blame my origins as a software developer origins. Um, my first job as a software developer on my uh, not introducing myself first. We we tend to do that as software developers. Um, so, um, and then now I'm an entrepreneur. My hobby is writing and discussing practical philosophy. And I'm also the executive director of the Freethinker Institute, which is the organization that um, is basically creating tonight's event. And we have these events every Tuesday evening um, to uh, basically, um, you know, we're, we're a not-for-profit and we're basically looking to support and empower members. Um, we basically want to help people be the best versions of themselves, seek truth, and be fair. Transformational personal and professional development. And Tony, I'm going to mute you. Um, and uh, we have free events every Tuesday evening covering a wide range of topics not typically covered in academia or industry. And we have members-only events that are about pra applying practical wisdom into our daily lives and creating a close network of people that um, we get to know uh, well and that we we basically help each other achieve goals, um, you know, life life goals and sort of take preliminary steps towards those life goals. We also have only one rule in the FTI and that is to remain polite. It is strictly enforced. So um, I will um, boot trolls and ask people to be polite. And if they don't, if they are not polite, then um, they will be removed. Um, and um, I uh, recommend, um, you know, uh, basically remaining dispassionate so, because being too passionate can end up uh, in someone not being polite. Um, and I would encourage people when they hear someone who has a very different opinion than them, rather than trying to prove them wrong, try to ask them why they came to the conclusions they did. We call that listening to understand in the Freethinker Institute. Um, which is really trying to empathize with the person that that you disagree with and try to understand why they came to their conclusion. So with that said, um, tonight's event is about leadership. Um, you know, leaders are basically the way that, um, or are the people that pave the way for a better future. And so we're going to talk about attributes that make an excellent leader, leader even a presidential leader. Um, and um, why, while I think that, um, you know, uh, probably um, most most of the ideas hopefully will sound relatively agreeable. I also have a, a rather unorthodox idea, which is that um, leadership traits should not be limited to people in leadership positions. I think that everyone should be a leader and we should all strive to be leaders in our own way. And um, I run my company that way as well and try to teach every team member to be a leader, even if they're an individual contributor. Um, and I would argue that um, Ethical leaders will listen to their subordinates um, and even subordinates, or I would just say team members, um, I guess I wrote this out too quickly, um, who act like leaders because really um, it's for the good of the group to listen to everybody's opinion with an open mind. Um, and so from my model of leadership, you know, we train everyone to be a leader rather than just leaders to be leaders, um, which most of what I've read on leadership, um, I think almost everything I've read, if not everything, um, really separates out the leaders from the followers. And I don't think there should be that distinction at all. Um, so we can talk more about that um, after the presentation. Um, I'm just going to be running through a Google Doc. I'm going to post the Google Doc for people that like to read ahead. Um, I don't mind if you do, um, as long as um, you take in the information. Some people are more visual learners and some people are more audio. And so you can pick and choose how you want to learn it. Um, and um, with that said, I'm going to share my screen and sort of go over what I think are, um, you know, key leadership attributes, um, including attributes for potential presidents. Um, and I'm going to ask people to hold questions until the end. Um, and then at the end, um, we'll have plenty of time for questions and for discussion um, and for people to present any 
leadership traits that I didn't include here. Um, I'm very fallible and I'm sure that I missed some stuff. Um, and um, I'm trying to continue to add to this doc and make it as comprehensive as possible. I also keep it in sort of priority order. And so I start with what I think are the most uh, important uh, leadership traits and then go down to um, lower, uh, you know, not, I would say like if there's a tie between two traits where they contradict each other, the one that I share first is the one that breaks the tie is really what it comes down to. Um, so that said, um, the first uh, the first one is about creating a shared vision. Um, this was something from my leadership training at GE, uh, change acceleration process training. It's black belt training at GE, um, talking about how you know leaders really should create a shared vision for a group and be able to communicate that vision um, to the group. Um, and that vision needs to be both actionable and doable, not completely disconnected from reality, but a vision that is even even if ambitious, somewhat in some way, shape, or form achievable. Um, and even though it may seem unachievable to a lot of people when um, JFK said we were going to put a man on the moon, um, it probably seemed unachievable to a lot of people, but we did end up putting a man on the moon, according to most of us, although there are some people who think that was a conspiracy. Um, but that said, um, I'm not going to go into that level of <laughs> doubt uh, tonight. But um, the next thing is to listen to everybody to gain an understanding of different perspectives and hear all ideas. As you can hear, that's sort of fundamental to my philosophy is, you know, listening with an open mind, um, as you probably heard already me talk about tonight. Um, the next is to give people credit for their ideas. Uh, there are a lot of leaders that like to um, listen to people's opinions. And um, I've seen this happen a lot of times where a team member will say something and then you know, a week, and then a leader will either ignore them or say, oh, no, that's not a great idea. We're not going to pursue that. And suddenly a week later, that's the leader's new idea. And um, and so um, I think it's really important to give people credit for their ideas. And uh, a self-confident leader doesn't mind giving credit to credit to and empowering uh, their team members and the people around them and that they work with. Um, the next is to be good at choosing the best ideas, regardless of where they come from. Um, and this is really about, um, you know, being a filter for good ideas, not always being the inventor of the good idea. The best leaders don't have to come up with the good ideas. They just have to be able to recognize what are good ideas and which ones should be taken action on or should have action taken on them and rally people around it. Um, and if you make a mistake that isn't, you know, and an idea isn't the best, then a good leader will change direction and move to a better idea. Um, if you have a good idea, and you know that it's a good idea, sticking with it, even if times get tough, is an attribute of good leaders. Now, that line is very blurred a lot of the time, and different people have different opinions. What separates the good leaders from the great leaders from the, the not so good leaders are the, the ones that are really good at making a distinction between when is it a really good idea that just hasn't had traction yet um, versus when is it a mistake and we need to switch directions. And, um, you know, this is predicting the future. No one can do that with absolute certainty. But, um, you know, there is, uh, there are like um, better and worse decisions that are made in those areas. And um, usually in the long arc of time, um, you, you see um, who's better at, at those things than versus other people. The next thing is to make sure that everyone is valued for their contributions. I think it's really important to, value everybody for whatever contributions they make and to appreciate them for their contributions, their positive contributions, and then, you know, give them uh, constructive criticism for areas they can improve. I think we'll get to that later. Um, another thing is, um, you know, finding the positive in any situation while still recognizing and addressing the negatives. What? No, 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 ora. Mañana. Um, and then, mañana, Pentesa. And then um, to teach people to accept responsibility for their mistakes um, and not punish for their mistakes, um, just to recognize them as mistakes and then move forward. And, you know, repeating the same mistake repeatedly can lead to changes in responsibility because it says that someone is not learning from their mistakes. Busco mami, busco mami. Pregunta de mami. Um, and then learning your subject matter expertise well, whatever 
you were intended to be good at, whatever your specialization is, learning that specialization well, I think is an attribute of a good leader. Um, and if your job is being a leader, then learning leadership well is, is your job. But um, for most people, we have other subject matters that we need to be good at as well. Um, if you're a sales leader, then being a good salesperson and knowing how to teach people to be good salespeople um, are, uh, you know, key attributes of a leader. So for just as an example, um, teaching your subject matter expertise openly and encouraging others to learn from it and teach, teach it as well, um, I would argue is a, an attribute of a good leader. I think um, too many people hide and guard their expertise um, as a competitive advantage. And so they, um, they really try to protect what, you know, what become fiefdoms or intellectual property that they want to be exclusive to them, um, whether it's about the company that they work for. And by the way, I have three monitors, so that's why I'm looking at it off in another direction. Um, so um, they, they try to protect their knowledge. And I think we've all run into these people at work where they, they don't like to share information. They just keep it to themselves um, and use it to, to um, consolidate their power. Um, the real leaders are the ones that are openly teaching and encouraging others to teach. The other thing is um, situational leadership is about tailoring your leadership style to meet the needs of the people that you're leading. And this is um, something taught by a leadership guru called named Ken Blanchard. Um, I got the I had the good luck of um, sitting in on a class of his in college. Um, and situational leadership is about understanding where someone is between motivation level being high or low and skill set being highly skilled or low skilled. And most people start out with low skill and high motivation, and it requires a different leadership style when someone is in that position versus when they're high skilled and high motivation. And usually the path goes, you start out with high motivation, low skill, and then you go low motivation, low skill, and then you get high skill and low motivation, and then you go up to high motivate, high, highly motivated and highly skilled when you can delegate to someone. Um, but each one of those different four, uh, uh, quaternaries, like four of a, uh, sections of a four blocker, require a different leadership style. And so I would argue good leaders know where the people they're working with sit in that four blocker, and they know how to tailor their leadership style to what that person needs. And the the general idea is you want to give direction to someone who um, you know doesn't have um, well I don't, I don't want to go through all of situational leadership but if you Google it um, there's a lot of good information on situational leadership situational leadership if someone wants me to go through the details of that afterwards just ask and I'll I'll go through it after I present um, we have a lot of bullet points to get through so um, next is ensuring that everyone has opportunities to grow and develop and so. That includes putting people outside of their comfort zone, which means making people uncomfortable sometimes. Um, you know, uncomfortable in that they may not be comfortable with the type of work that they're doing because they're working on something that's difficult for them. And you know, we grow through adversity. Um, when you're too far outside your comfort zone, you're in what I call the danger zone, and then you're afraid and you're not learning there either. In between the danger zone and the comfort zone is what I call the growth zone. And there is where you're growing constantly. And that's where I think a, a true leader keeps people in their growth zone, um, but outside of their comfort zone uh, as much as possible, because in the growth zone is where our comfort zone actually gets bigger and things that used to be in our growth zone become in our comfort zone and things that used to be in our danger zone um, become in, in our growth zone. And so we can start to do them and not be uh, afraid. And so keeping people in between that, uh, in that growth zone, I think is a key to good leadership and knowing where someone is, where they sit and communicating openly with them about where they are um, and recognizing where they are and keeping them in that growth zone, I think is a, an attribute of a good leader. Next is um, everyone in the organization should um, express the attributes of leaders. Like I said before, not just the leaders of the organization, being honest and transparent, um, you know, uh, if you're, um, if you're, uh, that includes being honest with yourself and having self-awareness where you realize and are able to communicate your strengths, your development areas, your leadership style, et cetera, so that you know how you work, you know, the best manager that I've had in my entire life on my, I think it was my first day or definitely my first week on the job sat me down and said, Garrett, this is my leadership style. 
And he walked me through all the things that he looked for from me as a team member of his. And, you know, he would, you know, things like, you know, I want to know about, you know, challenges that you're facing early on so that I can support you. I don't want to be surprised hearing about a challenge three weeks after it surfaced. And now it's been floundering for three weeks and I wasn't able to help you. And so knowing that I was able to bring challenges to him early on and he was able to support me and help me in dealing with them. And we had a, we made a great team because of me knowing his leadership style and knowing how to interact with him best. I'm a big fan of the platinum rule, which is to treat other people the way that they want you to treat them. And he taught me how to treat him as a leader. He said, this is how I want you to treat me as a leader. And so I did. And so we had a, a great um, relationship, um, you know, working together. Um, next is emotional self-regulation um, or EQ. Um, and this is, it's not only emotional self-regulation, but um, emotional self-regulation is one of the two sort of major aspects of, of uh, uh, EQ. And it's basically the ability to maintain a calm temperament in all situations. Um, and then I'll get to the other part uh, later on. Um, and then follow through on what you're going to say you're going to do, having consistency when you say you're going to do something, actually taking action on it and doing it so that people can learn to rely on what you say as being something that you're going to take action on. Um, it's a matter of integrity um, and integrity should be like number one here. Um, but I, I think, um, you know, I didn't put it explicitly, but it probably should be number one. Um, but um, so um Empowering others, um, I've already said in a couple of other different ways, um, but I have a saying that power should be used to empower rather than to overpower, um, meaning empower others instead of, you know, forcing them to do what you want, empower them to do the right thing themselves, and then creating an environment in which others feel supported to bring new ideas to the table. This is often talked about as, um, shoot, I just got a letter from uh, the Harvard uh, it's like Harvard leadership tip of the day talking about it. And Simon Sinek talks about it a lot is like um, psychological safety where a team feels comfortable, you know, admitting failures and bringing up new ideas, knowing that they may be bad ideas, but they can feel comfortable bringing them forward, knowing that they're not going to be penalized for their opinions and that everyone feels comfortable bringing their opinions and ideas to the table so that um, no one's going to be beat up for it. Or if you take a risk and try something, um, as long as you, you know, do it with transparency that um, you're not going to get, you know, beat up for making a mistake. We just learn from the mistakes. We don't beat people up for the mistakes and shoot the messengers. So, um, or even the the person who who made the mistake, not not necessarily the messenger. So um, that that creates more room for creativity and more room for expression. Um, next is to empathize with people that you lead so that you can see from things from their point of view. And that includes the ability to read others' emotions, which is the other half of EQ, um, which is emotionally reading the room and knowing, um, you know, what are other people going through? One of the books that I read on EQ talked about a kindergartner who walked into a brand new classroom and within, you know, five minutes knew exactly who was friends with who in the classroom who didn't like who in the classroom, that's someone with like a really exceptional set of this kind of EQ. And, um, and so being able to read other people's relationships through behavior and um, know how to avoid making someone else feel bad um, and how to make them think, um, you know, how to avoid having them uh, become upset where they may start thinking irrationally, um, that's a you know a key attribute for me of being a, a good leader. Um, and if it sounds like there's a lot here, there's a lot that goes into being a good leader, in my opinion. Um, that doesn't mean that all good leaders have all of these attributes, right? These are things that we strive for, and we acknowledge that we're not perfect, which is probably one of the attributes here. If we don't go through it, it should be in the list. Um, is to strive for being the best we can be. Um, but knowing that we're never going to be perfect and we always have room for growth. Um, so providing honest but respectful feedback to others, like that's what helps other people grow. Um, and also allowing other people to do the same for you. That's how we grow ourselves is by being receptive to other people's feedback. Um, if it's on point now, not every piece of feedback that we all get in our lives is actually on point, but listening with an open mind and, uh, 
an eye towards self-improvement and how can I be the best version of myself, seek truth and be fair, which is what we call the first intention of the Freethinker Institute is a good idea. And if the criticism does help you be the, be a better version of yourself, be closer to truth or more aligned with truth, or to be more fair, then it's probably something you should be paying attention to. Um, admitting your own mistakes is another one that I just alluded to a second ago. Um, being able to admit your own mistakes. This is what I would call is the difference between egotism and true self-confidence. The egotist does not admit their mistakes. Um, the self-confident person will seem very self-confident just like the egotist will but the self-confident person will readily admit their mistakes far more easily than the majority of people. Um, and so admitting your own mistakes is what creates true self-confidence. Um, true self-confidence comes from admitting your own mistakes readily once it becomes clear that they are mistakes. Um, next is to let other people lead the things that they own and coaching them if they fall short. You have to be able to delegate um, and mind you, in situational leadership, one of those four blockers is delegating. You don't delegate to everybody. Delegating to someone who doesn't have the skill set to take on a task is a bad idea. So delegation is not always the right answer in every leadership type. Um, it just depends on whether the person is ready to be delegated to yet or not. Um, someone who's high self-confidence and highly skilled is ready to be delegated to. And then you have to give them plenty of room to be able to lead their own uh, direction. And then you help coach them along the way. When they make mistakes, you help them learn from them um, if they haven't already done it themselves, although quite often those people will do it themselves. Um, next is to try to come to listen to all ideas um, and um, uh, evaluate the pros and cons and come to a consensus with a knowledgeable group, a group of people that are knowledgeable enough that they can contribute to that decision. Um, if you can't come to consensus, then generally the tie can be broken with a more senior person making the decision. But I'm a big fan of, you know, if you let everybody speak their mind and talk about the pros and the cons of all the decisions, um, you'll come to better decisions than you will by saying, you know, having the highest paid person in the room. The typical way I like to contrast this um, in my company is, you know, I say, and I do teach this in my uh, my. Uh, product management boot camp is that there are two decision-making styles. There's having the highest paid person in the room come in and say, we don't have time to talk about this. I'm going to make the decision and you're all going to like it. And anyone who disagrees with me is an insurrectionist and is going to get in a lot of trouble for disagreeing with me. Or there's, we don't have enough time to make bad decisions. So we're going to slow down on the important decisions. We're going to listen to everybody with an open mind. We're going to talk about the pros and the cons of the different options. And what I find is that when we do that, which we do that in play rate, we almost always come to consensus and almost always, quite frankly, unanimity, believe it or not. I kept track one month um, because one team member was concerned that we didn't have enough consensus and decisions. And I found that when I actually tracked it, we came to unanimity on almost like over 95% of decisions in a month, we came to unanimity. Um, because we let everybody speak their mind and everybody gave their perspective, you know, people just came to the same conclusions because they had all the same data and all the same information to put in uh, into the mix. And so I would argue that, you know, that's a better decision making process that self confident leaders don't mind doing. It's the insecure leaders that say, I have to be the decision maker and I have to be the one to make the decision and you're all going to like it or you all get in trouble for disagreeing with me. Um, Next is to be willing to help people you lead become equal to or surpass you um, if their motivation and talents could be better than yours. Um, I had a guy work for me early on in my career in GE that I was like, look, this guy's a lot better at a lot of the things that, um, you know, that are needed for my role than I am. And, you know, he was someone that I would have promoted past me. He ended up moving on to another um, he was in a leadership program. And so I only had one rotation with him. So he didn't actually report to me full time. but he was exceptionally talented. And, um, and so, um, but I would have had no problem, you know, from like recommending he get promoted to my level, because that would have been fair. And I would much rather be fair than be insecure about my own position. Um, and so I think that's, um, you know, a key attribute of being a good leader is to not, um, not try to limit people based on your relation to them currently but rather to try to help people 
um, achieve their full potential, no matter where you are and no matter where they are. Next is to make sacrifices and go above and beyond um, when it's needed for the good of the group. And a lot of the times the leader has to work the hardest. Um, there's a good, uh, I think there's a, I think it's a book um, called Leaders Eat Last. I don't agree with all the advice in the book. I read a, I read a Blinkist summary of it. Um, but um, the idea is that, you know, you put your team members first. Um, and that philosophy, I think, um, makes a lot of sense in a lot of ways. Um, and so I think um, being able to work a little bit harder as a leader and knowing that as a leader, you're more influential. And so every extra little bit of effort you put in has a, you know, yields often a higher result on the team and has a higher impact on the team's happiness and um, productivity. And so it's important that the leader be not the one working the least, but the one working the hardest. Um, and sometimes that requires sacrifice. Um, so uh, these traits should should actually help you motivate and inspire other people, uh, um, the traits of, of leaders. Um, and getting to know those you lead personally and understanding who they are and what motivates them and aligning your goals and their goals so that you can achieve um, common goals together. And so one of the things that I've always done, you know, even with my contractors when I was at GE, is understand what my team members' goals are. And when I understand their goals, I try to show them how the goals and the role will actually help them achieve their personal goals. And I try to give them work that will help them achieve their personal goals so that they're developing, they're not only contributing to the company as a whole, but they're also helping work towards their personal goals as well, which hopefully is more motivational for them than I just have to clock in and, and do a job and get it done at the end of the day. Um, and then uh, leaders set an example for what's acceptable behavior. Um, there are a lot of examples of leaders exhibiting very poor behavior. And I think, you know, that's not the kind of leaders that we should be putting into positions of power. We should put in place, you know, people who are model citizens across as many attributes of life as one can. None of us are perfect. We're all flawed human beings. But let's at least try to set a good example um, as leaders, whether we're individual contributor leaders or leaders leading large teams. Um, I think we, we are setting an example for what's acceptable behavior from the people that we lead. Um, Good leaders set an example by making sacrifices. So that's a duplicative. Um, I guess the the only part that I added here um, is setting aside their own personal interest when in when in conflict of, with the mission. So um, not using their power um, or discretion for their own benefit. And so it's about being altruistic um, and putting the good of the whole um, before the good of the self. Um, I have another argument, which I'll try to cover another day about how um, altruism is actually the best um, strategy, the winning strategy for um, uh, uh, someone is selecting all. So if you could not select all, um, it just highlights everything. Um, how altruism um, is the winning strategy, even for egotists. Um, and um, let me go to um and then next is um you know uh this was a um uh quote from sun tzu which is regard your soldiers as children so this is from 544 to you know like you know uh 500s bc um so regard your soldiers as your children and they will follow you to the deepest valleys look upon them as your own beloved sons and they will stand by you even unto death, if however you are indulgent, but unable to make your authority felt, kind-hearted, but unable to enforce your commands, and in incapable, moreover, of quelling disorder, then your soldiers, soldiers must be likened to spoiled children. They are useless for any practical purpose. And this is kind of the, um, the philosophy of the middle road, um, which is um, taught in um, ancient Greco-Roman philosophy as well, which is um, that there's kind of this middle ground um, that um, too much or too little is generally a bad thing. Moderation um, is generally a better um, a better path to go down. And and so, um, Ginny, if you don't mind, we'll do the questions at the end. But I will get to you. Um, we're almost done. We got two more to go. 
Um, but I think the idea is that um, you want to be um, disciplined and you want to teach discipline, but you want to lead with compassion um, and know that um, discipline and compassion can go hand in hand um, and that too much or too little of either one is not a good thing. Um, and um, good leaders, basically the, the general who advances without coveting fame and retreats without fearing disgrace, those who those whose only thought is to protect his country and do good service for a sovereign is the jewel of the kingdom. Now, this is a little bit, you know, this is from Sun Tzu's time, so it's a little bit top down, um, do good service for a sovereign, right, where the sovereign is the, the most important person. Um, I would argue that the the average citizen is the most important person in a society, um, but that's a different uh, a different story. Um, I do think that um, you know not coveting fame and retreating without fearing disgrace are you know good advice, um, and that really what he's trying to say here is to protect the country and do good for the you know the average um, like for society as a whole. Um, which at the time good for the sovereign was considered good for the, <laughs> the society as a whole, um, I would is kind of the way that I would interpret this in a modern light. Um, this is, you know, this is a quote from historical context. And then lastly, um, from Code of the Air Rescueman is it is my duty as a para rescueman to save life and aid the injured. I will be prepared at all times to perform my assigned duties and quickly and efficiently, uh, quickly and efficiently placing these duties before personal desires and comforts these things I do that others may live. And this is again about selflessness um, and um, the, um, uh, you know, I, I think is a, you know, good advice to follow is to, um, you know, be willing to be selfless. Mind you, I always encourage everyone, some people err too much on this side and are so selfless that they don't take care of their own personal needs. Um, and ultimately, if we can't take care of our own personal needs to be able to function in daily life, we can't really be of use to other people because we're not even taking care of ourselves um, at the, the basic level. And so I would argue we all have to take care of ourselves to a basic level so that we're highly functioning in daily life. And the more we increase our sphere of influence, the more we can positively influence other people with that sphere of influence. But the key there is we should use that sphere of influence to positively influence other people. And um, if we aren't even taking care of ourselves, you know, and our bare minimum needs, then we don't have much of a sphere of influence at all, um, because our sphere of influence doesn't even cover ourselves. So that said, um, that's kind of uh, what I wanted to present. And you guys all have the essay. So um, I'm going to uh, start with Ginny on questions or comments. Um, everything is welcome. So uh, everything polite is welcome, I should say. Um, so, um, Jenny, go ahead. I'm just curious, based on all these qualities that you mentioned in your presentation, how is it that somebody who lacks any of those qualifications become president of the United States previously, that is? I don't think even who you're referring to lacks all of these, but I didn't actually go through them and try to um, like look at that. But I would say um, a lot of, there are a lot of people that have misunderstandings about leadership and even misunderstandings or um, that would read read one leader's way of acting a different way than than other people would. And so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of room for ambiguity. And then there's also some areas where there isn't a lot of ambiguity. Um, and there's not consensus on these 32 values, right? These are things that I've Come across or come up with myself. Some of them I came up with myself. Some of them you see are quotes from famous people. Some of them are from books that I've read on leadership. And so there's not really a, a firm consensus on what are the attributes of good leaders. In fact, I've read some books that, um, that basically taught really unethical tactics about leadership. Um, and, and a lot of people use them as manuals. And um, a lot of people consider that leadership and good leadership. So it's a, it's, you know, all I would do is encourage everyone to look at this list with an open mind, give me your feedback on how I can make it better. And, um, you know, hopefully with more conversation and discussion, we can come to more consensus on what the attributes of good leaders look like. And we can start electing people who um, 
actually have these attributes of good leaders rather than uh, attributes of people that we would not want to put in positions of power. Well, Garrett, I, I'm not criticizing your uh, uh, attribute. I mean, your. Um, yeah, no, no, I, I know you're not. I know. I'm just partially being facetious, and you know who I'm talking I know. about. I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, but I try to stay political um, as much as I can. Um, so, um, although there is a circle in Dante's hell for those who don't speak up, and I don't want to be in that, um, even though I don't believe in Dante's version of hell, but um, that said, um, let me let Satemkia uh, go next. Uh, Ms. Fawn, sorry. Ms. Fawn, you're on mute. Thank you. I, I put some comments in chat, which I think are important. Things that I've always thought were important about leadership. Um, I'll start with something that I've done intuitively or instinctively all my life, when I see something that needs to get done, I'll just start doing it. I don't wait for someone else to do it. What happens is that this inspires the people around me, or it doesn't, but usually it inspires people. And I, I know that when I put forth my artwork in various communities, I found that I've been told this isn't something that I assume. Other women said to me, and it quite surprised me that I had inspired them. And I didn't know how I had done this because I didn't do anything in particular. I just shared my artwork without comment. But they felt that they saw my efforts to make something and it encouraged them to try harder, to work at it. And most of these women wound up surpassing me. The same way when I taught people to play chess, they wound up beating me all the time. That's all right by me. So a leader is someone who will hire people who are as smart and as creative as they can find. The leader is not worried if their talents and abilities Pass their own because the better your advisors and teammates, the better the final product will be. And then finally, and, and, and Sean um, put an interesting Chinese proverb in the chat that I rather like. Uh, where'd that go? An ancient Chinese proverb, failure is the mother of success. And this is absolutely true. I've heard someone who is an absolutely brilliant teacher talk about teaching techniques. And one of the things that he teaches is that mistakes and failures are not bad. They're actually good things. They show you what does not work. It's like Thomas Alva Edison saying, well, now I know a thousand ways I can't make a light bulb. Um, you know what does not work. And if you work either on your own or as a group, and he does this with his entire math class involved, they find the solution on their own. He doesn't tell them why it's wrong. He encourages them to figure it out. And this is an important thing that people need to learn. If you look at millionaires and billionaires, they've all been bankrupt often more than once. Now we're not talking like Trump where he's always bankrupt, but we're talking, you know, like your major people, whether it be a Rockefeller or, or any of these other names that you see, they've all gone bankrupt on occasion. From each bankruptcy, they learn how to make their business better. And this is the attitude that you need to have as a leader, that 
um, you walk your teams through the process of discovering a better way. And um, that's it. Oh, I'll make a brief comment about Discord that for those of you for whom this matter, the conversation goes on 24 seven. It never stops. I, I see the posts going across the top of my screen at every hour of the day. But I will, I will also say that you don't have to participate anytime you don't want to. Like people are free to chat whenever they're free, you know, across all time zones, but you can kind of come and go when you want. And as I showed, it's very easy to see what happened since the last time you came. And then you can come and chime in on whatever was said since the last time you visited. If you want to. Yeah. If you want to, or you can just skip it. Right. And just see what the most recent three comments were and comment on those if you want to there. And if you don't, then you can skip that. It's very much up to you what, what you comment on and what you don't. Well, when um, I first joined FTI, I tried to participate in every conversation and it wound up and that's all I did. And it was too much and I burned out. Now, when the conversations interest me, I will chime in. Otherwise, maybe I'll track it, maybe I won't. But there's always something interesting going on. As, uh, so if you want to join in, you can. And I'll shut up. <laughs> no worries. You, you reminded me, I forgot to say, um, we do try to keep com com uh, comments and questions to under three minutes. And to keep it to one topic um, with each comment and question. And if you have more than one topic you want to bring up or question you want to ask, just raise your hand again, like put your hand down after you ask your question or make your comment and then raise your hand again and then we'll we'll call on you again so that we cover, we, we let everybody get the chance to speak. So that said, I want to let Katie go. Um. Yeah, I thought uh, your, your presentation, this is my favorite presentation I've seen yet. Um, Thank you. A lot of effort went into this one, to be honest. So not quite as much as the free will one, but I don't think you were there for that one. So. Yeah, Jimmy was talking about uh, qualities before they come in. And then your presentation was great about talking about once they're in and once you notice that there's a problem. Because um, I remember when I when I did work in politics, I remember there was an issue with somebody and the rumor mill was kind of saying like that they would keep paying his salary, but they would take away the responsibility so that it wouldn't appear to him like anything was happening. But basically, he got the responsibilities taken away from him mm -hmm. in a functioning. And I, I, I have no way to verify whether that was true or not true. Um, but um, in a functioning democracy, you know, someone might get impeached. And that's what you see with Putin is that you can't you can't get him out of there you know you were hoping for like the you know maybe he could get assassinated or you know these kind of extreme scenarios but in a functioning in a functioning organization or anything like usually it will be taking taking away responsibilities from that person yeah no that's a great point katie theoretically that that should happen in a functioning democracy but as you mentioned, like we're supposed to be a functioning democracy. And you even have an example where I would bet that what you were told was probably true. Like the person probably just got sidelined and other people started making the decisions and they got to collect their salary, but they, you know, for political reasons, the, the party probably didn't want to take a loss at like a vote of no confidence and, you know, have be seen as putting up an incompetent leader. But to your point, you know, Putin, you know, Putin basically kills anyone that is a political rival or puts them in jail. So he really has no competition because anyone that is competition, he eliminates in one way or another. China is the same way there. You know, there is no competition for, you know, Chinese elections, quote unquote. Um, and so there are a lot of countries that have faux democracies like the People's Democracy of North Korea um, or People's Republic of North Korea. Um, Democratic Republic of North Korea. Sorry, super democratic, right? So um, that said, um, thanks for your comments, Katie, and uh, uh, appreciate it. Jeffrey, go ahead. Yeah, um, 
thank you for the, the presentation. I, I think that uh, the first comment brought up uh, really some assumptions that lie behind your uh, best scenario model and that it assumes uh, uh, a social acceptance of democratic principles and the desirability of a collaborative workspace. Uh, we are at a, a time where a lot of people are surprised that authoritarian forms are uh, taking predominance in nations. Uh, and you, know, uh, you could argue also uh, with strong leader corporations and multinationals. Uh, so that when we, we look at defending democracy, we have to look at all levels, uh, you know, right down to uh, you know, town governments and even, even the hierarchical family uh, where the father is the only authority and you don't cross him. Uh, you know, there's some similarity between that and uh, an autocratic uh, government. I've been a, dis a district leader and I see how candidates are chosen and when you have a narrow funnel for candidates, you're going to have a narrower uh, you know, channel even for the victorious candidate. And in the not-for-profit sector where I've done consulting, uh, one of the best things that's, that's happened of late, as I would say the last 15 years, is a strategic plan uh, that takes a deep dive and includes all members of the organization inputting into the strategic strategic plan. So it gets proposed, goes down to all the, the levels and comes back up and is, is modified vis-a-vis uh, -vis the comments. So uh, having, having some consensus as to what the operating values are, I think is also uh, an important group dynamic. I mean, the leader, the leader uh, and, and the, the mentee you know, is one dynamic, but there has to be some commonality if that is to uh, perform in a productive uh, and fair way. Totally agree, and really good points. And um, you know, you you touched on a lot, including patriarchy um, and um, an interesting random fact. Since I studied some Greco-Roman history, is that a Roman father was technically legally allowed to kill his children. And I forget the exact um, auspice it was done under, but it was essentially being um, disrespectful towards or disagreeing with or rebelling against the father. He was legally allowed to kill them and not, not get accused of murder. Um, so patriarchy goes a long way back and in, in a very serious level of like um, legal authority granted to it for a long time. Um, and I think you're right that um, it all starts with, as the other person mentioned, and as you mentioned, it starts with coming to consensus on what these leadership values are that we should want in our leaders. And all I would do is encourage everyone to say, does the list I said sound good? Does it sound like leadership attributes that you would want to be led by a person with those attributes? And if so, then maybe we should put into place people who have those leadership attributes and put them forward. And if not, then tell me where I'm off and let's fix the list so that we have a good consensus. And, um, and let's, let's come to consensus on what the list of desirable attributes of leaders are. I have a friend that sent me a list on how um, the rise of the strong man, um, which I need to read, I just haven't had time. Um, and so I'm sorry, I didn't read it before tonight, because I could probably comment on sort of why that is happening more than um, than I can. But um, Jeffrey, if you have any ideas on why that is or have read about it, I would be curious to know. I have one essay written on the subject of um, uh, a related subject, but not directly hitting that head on. That said, I want to let, um, thank you, Jeffrey, for your comments. Great, great comments. And I want to let Anna go. I'm struggling a little bit with how to say this. But um, I felt that it was too paternalistic, if that makes sense. Um, maybe it would work in some situations, but I think you've kind of ignored collaboration, which can be 
a good thing. And it definitely does. That's not the way our politics works, for sure. I mean, right now, money is what talks. He who can make the biggest uh, fool of himself say the most outrageous things and have the most money seems to get elected. And then we have no recourse, really. I mean, I realize that legally we may, but it doesn't work that way. When's the last time you saw someone impeached, for example? Well, we did have a president impeached recently. He just wasn't removed from office, but he was right. impeached. Um, but you're, was you're, right, you're right across most attributes there, um, Anna. Like money does buy power now um, that corruption is legalized. And we had two other sessions on that. Um, the part that I didn't understand is um, why you felt like I ignored collaboration. I felt like I actually am much more advocating for collaborative values than anything else I've read on leadership, you know, even the idea of like being very consensus driven in, in leadership style and listening to everyone with an open mind and making everyone a leader. I could name, you know, six different attributes that were more collaborative than everything that I read about in leadership books. So I'm curious why you felt like it was more um, top down. It seems like you were feeling. Because at the final analysis, it seems as though, um, Yes, you were allowing for it, but not welcoming it, if that makes sense. Okay, you can rise up, but you're still making the judgment. And um, did that make sense or shall I continue? <laughs> um, I, I don't know where I said that. If you can refer back to like which bullet point, I don't know if you're in the Google Doc, but maybe refer back to which bullet point, maybe take a look and then raise your hand again with which bullet point you felt like gave that impression because I absolutely want to give the opposite impression of what you're saying I gave. So I apologize if I didn't communicate clearly, but um, you know the, the last couple of quotes are from Sun Tzu, which again, he's from like 500 BC. And so- his quotes are very paternalistic, but they were the least important ones that I gave. And at the very end, for that reason, you know, as I mentioned, the early ones were the ones that were the highest priority and the most important. And most of those were all about collaboration and listening and, you know, how the leader should not be the one to make the decision. It should be a consensus based well, decision after listening to everyone with an open mind. But the leader is the one kind of, I don't know, my impression was guiding the outcome or making the decisions as to, okay, this didn't work, let's try something else. I think basically my problem with it was, and I know you worked hard on it and it was really good. It was much too long. Mm -hmm. I think it you could have shortened um, the number of points you made plus within each point shortened it. I mean, you could talk about it, but that to me, I think it lost me to the point where why, when I got to the bottom, I went, oh. Yeah. <laughs> and I was following along on my screen. So I'll um, maybe raise my hand again. Thank you. <laughs> No problem. Thanks, Anna. Sorry it was too long for you. Um, so, Benjamin, go ahead. Hi there. I don't think I have an echo. Nope, no echo. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that your your presentation on uh, leadership was was good. Um, you seem like you would be uh, like a really good leader for for. Uh, I'm a software developer. I've been at the same company now for about 15 years and I've had good leader and I've had a bad leader and your um, your document does outline like 100% what describes the good leader in my experience um, and the opposite for the bad leader. 
um, save for maybe one thing that that you could add, but and and this is uh, when you when you're it also kind of applies to politics, and that is uh, the quality of nationalism, which unfortunately in a in a leader or a boss in a corporate situation, nationalism can go really far if you feel like you're part of a team that is like it's all for its, its own preservation and everything is like, our team is great and everyone else is crap. And if you have a leader that does that, then your team really has a sense of cohesion and things get done. But I don't know if it's great for a country. Um, you have problems when that happens, I think. Yeah, so so um, that's a great point. And um, I'll have to go back and see if I can um see if that if i'm not addressing that it's an important point to address um and i i actually don't remember anywhere that i did so i think you're right that i didn't but um the um the um the idea is if i'm hearing you right is that it should be a um like the team should do what's in the best interests of everybody not just what's in the best interests of the team is that am i paraphrasing that right well, it depends. Like, if you want to do well as a team, then having a nationalist attitude towards your own team can make the team go really far. It might not be the best for the, the company or like the grander scheme of things, but it works out well. Do you need to take seriously and respond to this? Other stuff. Sorry, Mike, you, you were off mute there for a second. I think let's let Benjamin finish his thought. Like I've had, I've had uh, a leader who who was pretty good, and very nationalistic. So like every every uh, other department, they would be crap. So everyone from like another department, this is this person has to be like put down, and and our team elevated, and it makes like our team feel good, and we have a very productive team, and overall like that team rises up in the company because he he promotes the employees to upper management, um, his his underlings get kind of rise up in the ranks and we look good. But, right. So it's it's kind of nationalism on a on a corporate structure. And I think it goes far, but I don't know if it's a good way that anything should be run on a country level. So I don't know if the uh there's a parallel there. Yeah, I think there yeah, is a there parallel. Is. I think there is a parallel. Um I think we should we should table if you don't mind, I'm not gonna address the nationalism versus globalism because we're going to have another event on globalism and we should talk about in that event globalism versus nationalism um and you know what's what's the you know the better path uh, if there is a better path i think there is but we'll we'll talk about it that night um but i think to answer the question about in an organization you can very easily see a path where your team could do a great job and this leader could make his team look great, but it could completely tank the company, right? You could get all the resources and be the resource hogs of the company, but then let's say the developers, right, get all the resources and there's no sales and marketing money left over and the company doesn't do any more sales because there's no sales and marketing budget because all the money went to the engineers. I think you said you were an engineer. And then suddenly the whole company goes bankrupt and now everybody loses their jobs, including your team, because your boss was so good at promoting his team that he took away all the resources from the people that the balance that's required to grow a company and make it successful. So, you know, there's a very easy contrived scenario where, you know, too much focus on one team. And I would argue that, you know, less extreme examples like can show the same problem where one team when it overshadows the rest and is an imbalance, whereas where I was saying that middle road is like the, we want to promote people in our team, but we want to do it in a way that's good for everybody. But I think you're right that I didn't really address that. So I appreciate the feedback. Did I, did I hit the point on the head, Benjamin? I think so, but uh, I'm going to raise my hand again in a bit. I'm going to think about it. Okay, no problem. Sean, go ahead. Uh, of course, a leader should have a lot of uh, good qualities. So I'm going to use a live example, okay? 
to illustrate uh, to the leader. Uh, Maryland uh, former governor Larry Hogan. He's a Republican. He went once in a blue state, okay, um, because he did a good job. Focus on economy. Um, this past weekend, right, during the media press, I think uh, he said very well, well, okay. He said, look, he, he, most people think he could be a Republican candidate for 2024. So what he said, he said, if we can stop Trump and elect a common sense candidate, I will not enter because he's very obvious more common sense candidate enters the race. They were split, you know, split the, the, the vote. Trump going to, to win nomination. So, so he said, I'm doing this because I care about the party or our country. Not a, I'm, I'm, I don't have to worry about my own political future. So this is the leader we need. US right now is so, so, um, divided. So, of course, our leader should have either visionary, charismatic, decisive, and then um, honest and ethical. I think right now we really need someone is unified, okay? Not, a, not someone intentionally divide our country further for his political gain. America is not in good shape right now. It's, it's very, very bad. It's become, I think, I don't know. Say I came from China. I, I, a lot of days I even don't talk to any of my friend in China, okay? Uh, I don't have any to talk. This is the US politics right now. It's part of a joke, okay? So I feel bad, so it's pretty bad. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it. Um, I do want to mention um, uh, Carly Carly asked a question. Uh, wonder if any of these points relate to presidential methods or operations. I would argue all of these traits are the leadership traits that we should expect not only from leaders in our industry, but of a president as well. Um, and it's even more important as the president to be exhibiting more of these leadership qualities. I think the bar should be higher for a president or a prospective president to be exhibiting more of these leadership traits, like to think that the average person, you know, has all of these 32 traits um, and exhibiting them with strength is really hard. You know, it's, it's a lot to, you know, it's a lot to be able to manage, but a president is, you know, one out of 300 million people, you know, they're an exceptional person, right? They need to be an exceptional person because, they're leading, you know, they're leading the direction of the government. Um, so we should have a higher expectation of a president having all of these leadership attributes than the average person. And I just wanted to bring that up because, um, you know, she didn't raise her hand, but, um, and I don't know if she's even still here, but, um, but I thought it was a good question. So, um, Susan, go ahead. Okay, yes, thank you. I um I wanted to know right uh, uh we have a unqualified uh, uh leader for a president right do we have any plan or any safeguard so that that doesn't happen again in the future uh, is our country the only country that have two uh, results for one election you know we have the electoral college vote process and we are also the uh what is the popular Right, Garrett? Yeah, so yeah. I don't know. Yeah, going forward, do we have any, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, any mean, any way so that that doesn't, you know, because I think Mr. Trump, like, woke us up. I know, I think America, like, woke up when, um, and no offense again, Mr. Trump, you know, like, uh, qualification, I agree with, uh, like, uh, China and other people too, you know, like, uh, compare resume between Mr. Trump and um, Sec Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Clinton at the time, 
you know, the, the resume said that, but you know, uh, I don't know, the electoral, co the electoral college vote decided the, uh, the person to go and be the, the leader of the country, not the popular vote. Yes, yeah, I, I have a, a, a very um, a difficult to understand the electoral, electoral college vote. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah so the electoral college, um, you know, is uh, a complicated subject, one that we probably don't have time for tonight. Um, I don't want to get too much into like, you know, Trump, but I would I would argue that, um, you know, if nothing else, like probably it's clear that Trump doesn't align with most of the leadership attributes that I put forward. So I would guess that, um, you know, if someone thinks that he does, I would love to hear the perspective where he does. Um, but um, I don't think he exhibits most of the leadership traits um, or even a majority of the leadership traits that I put forward. Um, but I, I could be wrong about that and I welcome someone pointing it out if I am. That said, um, uh, uh, Susan, as far as like, is there a, a way of something being put in place to prevent, you know, a leader? There's no, there's no like, there's no like, the only, the process in place to prevent someone from un, unfit for leading getting put in place is the whole process that we just talked about is the whole right. presidential election process is a very carefully thought out process and actually the electoral college was intended to prevent the populous states from overriding the election and not giving the less populated states a voice what has turned out to happen is that now our presidential elections are mostly decided by 12 otherwise not very you know populated and not very um influential states and those you know 12 or so states are the ones deciding who the president is more or less on their own because all the other states are pretty much done deals as far as who they're going to vote for so it's kind of like i don't think the founding fathers thought you know 300 years ahead to like where we are today like we're in a very different place than they were then and um, and so I think the Electoral College um, made some sense at the time and it was done for the right reasons, but I don't know that it's actually had the positive effect that the founders intended for it to, which is why I think it would be an interesting topic for another night. Um, but that said, I want to let um, I want to let Harry go. Yeah, OK, I'm sorry. Yeah, did you want to respond to that, Susan? Go ahead. Yeah, can we can we er er eradicate that, though? And it seemed to me like it's based on campaigning. There's a big movement, Susan, to eradicate the um, the electoral college by having um, what what it what needs to happen is that each state needs to vote in the state legislature to agree that its state's um, electoral votes will go to whoever wins the popular majority. And so there is a big movement to have more states ratify that right. um, in their state legislatures the problem is the states that really need to do it are the swing states and why would they do that when they're the ones deciding who the president is now and if they did that then they would suddenly have far less influence than they do now so the problem with that movement is that the states that are the ones that we actually need are the ones least likely to ratify it although if enough other states do no i don't think i don't think there's a way that um it can actually like Usually there's momentum around something where if enough states ratify it, then everyone will. But I don't know in this case if it'll happen. I, I hope that it will, because I think that, you know, the majority sort of makes the most sense now in the modern world, but um, that's just my take. So that's right. um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. Harry, go ahead. So I realized that you did a lot of hard work in thinking about all of these traits. And, um, it, you know, the, the problem, of course, or one of the problems is that it, leadership is a very hard thing to generalize about <laughs> because mm -hmm. organizations are so different, right? Um, and I know most of my reading, I'm, I'm a history buff, most of my reading is in political and military history. Um, and so that kind of skews my thinking about leadership, right? Yeah. Um, to, to, and, and I worked for a big company when I was working. So, um, 
and and one of the things that that really comes out and and you sort of addressed it i don't know i guess indirectly but maybe not so directly is that in a larger organization choosing the people who are leading under you is a huge determinant as to whether a particular leader is viewed as being successful or not um and, and i don't I, I don't know if that's worth addressing in in uh in something like like what you're trying to do um you know i i the, the last book i read was uh, on the history of ancient rome and it was about the conflict between uh, octavian who became augustus and caesar and cleopatra and octavian's huge advantage was he was not a military leader but he had a guy under him named agrippa who was a an incredibly brilliant general uh, uh, military leader both on land and on sea and it was because he trusted that person to make decisions that he was actually able to win the battle where antony and cleopatra were kind of divided about what they exactly wanted to do and didn't have as as brilliant a leadership structure um so, and I, I thought the question that Benjamin raised is, is, is a really good one because, um, you know, leadership works on a lot of different levels, right? So you can be a great leader in a small group, but how big is your, you know, how big is your thinking to encompass, like, where is this organization, what is the, the ultimate goal of this organization? Uh, even though I'm only in charge of a small part of it. So, yeah, I think that's, a, you know, something we're thinking about. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And um, we we share a love of uh, military history. I, I got halfway to a minor in history, all taking Greco-Roman military courses. Um, and um, and so, yeah, like, um, you know, I'm I'm very anti Clausewitz. If you're a fan of him, um, I have a very different perspective on leadership than Clausewitz, who was like, crush the opposition, like no matter what, at all costs, like do whatever you need to do to crush them. Um, and that's not kind of the way that I um, that I think that things should be done. Um, and so um, I do um, I do think that. Um, that Benjamin had a great point, and that's why I acknowledge that I think it was a weakness in the the values that I put forward, um, and something that I'll I'll fix, um, you know, when I when I get uh, some quiet time to sit down and figure out where to address it. Um, but essentially, I I at least have like a solution, which is that um, you know I think um, that um, the 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 ethical leader will actually do um, what's in the best interest of everyone that they can influence with their influence. And that I think um, sort of addresses his, uh, his good point that um, I didn't address that. Um, and it's, it's really um, part of what the Free Thinker Institute is about is increasing happiness and decreasing harm. That's the overall mission of the organization. And so what I would argue is the good leader will actually increase happiness and decrease harm for everyone that they and their organization can influence, which includes not only the entire organization, but potentially even broader than that. Um, and so, um, but um, but yeah, great points. And, um, and yeah, I love Greco-Roman history. Um, so, um, Ms. Fawn. Um, yeah, thank you. Um... A couple of really brief remarks. Um, in response to what Gregory was asking before, um, I had immediate response to what he was suggesting. When it goes to the national level and it gets overdone, it's called fascism. And Trump approached that, but he was more like Benito Mussolini, more a cult of personality than a fascism. But um, by definition, that's what it is. Um, and I don't remember what else I was going to say, so I'll 
I'll leave it at that. Oh, I, I, I have a, just a quip. You know, if a guy does it, we call it patronizing. If a woman does it, is it matronizing? Um, and I was thinking about this earlier when Anna was talking about that your suggestions seem very patronizing. But that is susceptible of a particular point of view. Uh, taking care of other people is nurturing. It's neither patronizing nor matronizing. It's nurturing. And that's what a good leader ought to be. And I'm done. Thank you, Ms. Vaughn. Um, Anna, go ahead. Um, th thank you, Ms. Vaughn, um, <laughs> for your comments. Um, I agree with them. Um, I, when Harry was speaking, I couldn't help thinking of the Peter principle. And I think this may come into play in many places where someone does a good job at a lower level. You may be the best uh, coder or programmer or whatever. So what do we do? We promote them up to be a leader. Well, that doesn't mean they're going to be a good leader. Maybe we should pay them more for what they're really skilled at. That was just one of my thoughts. My other thought, Garrett, was when you were, which is why I, re I raised my hand, was um, I can see how this would w work with politicians, except that they seem to be so ego driven. I mean, there are some politicians that really want to do good, but there are so many that are so ego ego driven. And I don't think we need that. And I don't have a way to separate them. That's all. Yeah, Anna, I would encourage you to look for which politicians admit they're wrong sometimes. The ones that will admit that they're wrong sometimes are the ones that are not ego driven. And I will tell you, there are few and far between. Um, but to me, that's the distinguishing factor between egotism and self-confidence. The people who admit when they're wrong, those are self-confident people because they're willing to admit they're wrong, which takes self-confidence, right? Because you can be seen as weak for admitting you're wrong. Like in politics, we call them flip-floppers. And my oh. answer to that is like, what's wrong with admitting you're wrong? Like, we don't want people who like, um, you know, um, the, you know, who will buckle down and say they're right, even when it's clear that they're wrong, right? And what we're really doing is we're creating a breed of politician that will refuse to admit they're wrong if that's what we elect. And so we have to, you know, choose to elect people who acknowledge when they're wrong, admit it, and own up to it and improve from it, rather than continuing to elect people who are not flip-floppers and demonizing people for being flip-floppers or even demonizing for them, them for having good intentions. A lot of politicians get demonized for having good intentions. It's like, oh, this is, you know, you know, this is super unrealistic, even though these things are often very realistic if you make the right decisions in government. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a lot of misunderstandings when it comes to uh, the population, which Darlene mentioned, I think in the chat um, that there are a lot of misunderstandings amongst people about you know what what should we be looking for and what should we be electing, and that's why you know that's why we have these events is to teach people um, to think for themselves. And I think if we all think for ourselves with a higher sense of confidence, we'll be better capable of electing better leaders. And if we are better capable of electing better leaders, we're going to have a better country. And in fact, our better country will create a better world. And right now we're not doing that on a regular basis. We're creating often a very worse world. And there's a lot of, you know, nationalism, a lot of like bad things that our country does to other countries in order to create U.S. hegemony. Um, and um, that bothers me. And I want to get rid of politicians who do those things so that we can actually make a better world. 
And that starts from us being leaders as leaders of the free world, we're called, um, because we're the wealthiest country in the world. And as such, we are in a leadership role, whether we like it or not. And so we, we should be doing good in the world, not um, causing harm. Um, and I also wanted to agree with what Harry said, which is that, um, that a lot of times leaders are, you know, judged on um, whether or not they um, like uh, have people working for them that are skilled. So I agree with that completely, by the way. I think you might have left, but, uh, oh no, he's still here, I'm just off video. So Jeffrey, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, Susan's concern is uh, a primary reason why this whole discussion is so important. And in response to her concern, I would say uh, the defense of democracy at all levels is the way to uh, ensure that this uh, type of thing does not happen. Because what does what was, does the fascist want? The fascist wants the individual citizen, individual voter to surrender his choice and simply follow uh, the leader. And uh, the hierarchical system all relates back to the, the top leader and is derivative of it and obedience rather than free thinking. Is the operating uh, is the operating principle? Um, I, I recently um, I'm a district leader and I, I I spoke at a meeting in White Plains, New York. We had a police involved shooting, uh, and the thing went to trial, and uh, all the facts came out, and uh, there was a vote in the city council, and we had the city council members stand up and say wait a minute, you elected us. You don't try to tell us how to vote on this. And uh, uh, I got up and I said, listen, yes, you were uh, voted in because of uh, your principles and your, your abilities, but you still have to respond to constituencies. You know, it, we did not rubber, rubber stamp everything you would ever do. Right. We voted you and we can vote you out. <laughs> yeah. And we can do a vote of no confidence. Well, the, <laughs> so the wake up, buddy. <laughs> like the vote eventually yeah. was two thirds. You know, we are recommending that you mediate the case as the judge suggests rather than going on and not accepting blame. So um, I and I, I keep saying uh, to, to people in White Plains. Yeah, you, you talk about being at the table. Why not be at the local table, which is the easiest one to get to with the greatest access to the so-called political leader? And it's it's the local political clubs are the feeders for higher office. Yeah. So uh, if we're going to, uh, it's it's not establish, it's defend the system we've had. Yeah. And yeah. the congressional system changed radically with Gingrich. Uh, with the whole uh, committee structure yeah. and and uh, seniority changing over based upon uh, political and financial uh, prominence, so yeah. that we've got a lot of ground to recover. And uh, I'm uh, on the board at the Ethical Culture Society in Westchester, and we have a project of civic involvement aimed at doing it precisely that. We're also examining the Unificial, Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a humanist set of principles that not, that's not institutionally constrained uh, as a frame for discussing uh, legal rights and that every human being uh, has human rights. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, it, it's quite amazing. If you take a look at that, it makes intractable problems pretty straightforward. But uh, there's a reason that uh, this country is not signed on to it. And uh, it's, it's very problematic. But I say the defense of democracy is the highest priority in our present, present period. And that would apply to corporations as well, especially in, uh, in the tech area and the, the media area, because there's your public opinion being manipulated. Right. I'm going to agree with you and say, why I think it's so important is as soon as you lose democracy, 
you lose the ability to vote in place, to vote out of power, the people who abuse power. And so once you lose democracy, you're not getting it back, you know, short of a violent revolution, which is, you know, a really tough thing to pull off, quite frankly, in the modern world, as China has seen, even though they've had rising protests for the last 20 years, there's still the same Chinese government in place that's been in place since they, you know, basically backstabbed the, the government that was in place, um, the Republican government, um, you know, the, the communist backstabbed the Republican government um, in uh, World War II. Um, and the other thing that you reminded me of, Jeffrey, um, is that, um, you know, while we live in a democratic republic and our laws are written by elected officials, we all work for companies that are autocracies. Every company is an autocracy. And we spend minimum eight hours a day. I usually spent 12 hours a day when I was working for a company in that company and doing what my management wanted. And it's a, the boss is right. And no matter how right you are, if the boss tells you to do something that you don't agree with, you agree with the boss or you get fired. You can be as right as you know anything and your boss could be as wrong as anything. It doesn't matter. You'll still get fired. It's an autocracy. And if anyone wants to challenge that, try being right when your boss is wrong and your boss doesn't want to admit they're wrong, try challenging them and see who wins. I don't recommend actually doing this. Um, I've played that game and the boss wins, um, no matter how wrong they are. So, um, so yeah, like we, we really don't, we, even though we live in a democracy, theoretically, from a government structure perspective, um, our companies are not democratically structured. And I think that it would be interesting to see more democratically structured uh, organizations um, in play. And, you know, if I ever make enough money, I'm going to play around with that. But that said, um, you know, really good points, Jeffrey. And if you want to talk about collaborating um, with your organization in Westchester, I want to echo your um, your call to people to get involved in local politics. And I want to encourage people that are free thinkers to actually run for local politics, because we need more people that actually have good intentions running for office and if we just keep bad mouthing the people who are in office without being the leaders ourselves that can replace them, how can we expect them to be replaced? So, you know, let's have good people start run for running for local office and moving up the moving up the ranks. You know, um, AOC has a lot of uh, you know uh, press, whether you love her or hate her, but she used to be a bartender and now she's a congressperson, right? So that tells you like. You can go from whatever you're doing now to a congressperson um, because some people have, and there are people on both sides of the aisle that have done this, and um, and so it's a it's a thing, and anyone can anyone can run for office these days. I'm telling you, the bar is not that high, so um, I want to encourage people to run for local politics um, and get involved. Uh, Benjamin, would love to hear what you have to say. I, I mean, I, I agree that uh, we live in uh, companies that are autocracies, 100%. But I don't agree that we are a de democracy. We are not a democracy. We are an oligarchy and a plutocracy. Um, the uh, money determines who gets elected, um, not people. There have been studies that show this. Um, there are exceptions like AOC and Sanders who try to push against it and try to run on policies, but it's pretty much futile. They don't get very far. Um, I don't, yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. The only other thing that I would say is when I noticed that, I think that, that it needs to, we need to push ideas, not people. Um, I think it's important that we, we have to run ideas and uh, I've seen various software that helps to uh, to do this. Yeah. So so Benjamin, I I I call this a democratic republic because that's technically what we are. But you're also right that we're really more or less an oligarchy and a plutocracy. And um, that was shown in a Princeton. I think it was Northwestern was the other um, organization that that did the study even before Citizens United that showed that 
um, political policy was only influenced by people in the top 10% of wealth earners. And then with Citizens United, where you're allowed to give unlimited amounts of money to a politician without anyone but you and the politician knowing that you gave the money, that just widened the door for putting more money into politics when already money was controlling politics. Even before that, now it's like got a stranglehold on politics. And so if we want to save our democracy, as has been said, we really need to take very swift action and get the word out to more people that our democracy is truly at risk. And we also, I'm going to encourage, we need to talk with an open, we, we need to listen with an open mind, to the perspectives of people who disagree with us. And we need to listen to why do they think that it's not at risk? Why do they think things are okay? And when we hear them say their reasons, if we, if we really can understand where they're coming from and find some flaw in their argument, we should ever so politely point it out after understanding their perspective really well. And then we may have a, an effort, we, have, we may have a chance at influencing them and helping them see what's really going on. Um, but right now is, you know, it's the ancient Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. Boy, do we live in interesting times. Um, and uh, it's time for people to step up. And I'm trying to do so in my little way. And I hope that each of you do as well. So um, that said, I want to let Susan uh, go next. Uh, yes, my uh, my question is, you know, how you say at the beginning of this um, uh, uh, lecture that, uh, you know, like people at work uh, protecting their knowledge, uh, they're not sharing the consolidated power. And uh, since we are like a autocracy, like you said, I agree because, you know, like the elite, the, the people uh, in authority, in charge, they, um, they are um, working with one another. So people like me, I am just a worker, right? I don't have uh, the same, uh, the same right, the same leverage, you know, like them, because during, um, uh, you know, like, uh, like we have this thing called employment at will, um, Garrett. Oh, you are tired. But anyway, I I'm, I'm boring you. <laughs> no, you're not boring me. I, I am tired. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just that employment at will. I we like to, this country have that because it's come from a, a, a master and servant society, and they still have that law, even though it's obsolete. Uh, you know, you uh, th there are always a reason that uh, you discharge an employee, you know, but it seems like, you know, it's being used, you know, when in cases that um, uh, non disclosure cases, you know, oh, oh, I mean, can anyone do anything about that, you know, because unless I'm unionized, right, nobody fight for me. My line of work don't have uh don't have don't have that uh, protection. Yeah. Thank yeah, I mean, you. I, your situation is much more complicated, Susan. I think looking for you know public advocates and and people, you know, social services is like a better path to go down for you, um, yeah. which I know you're you're pursuing. But um, unions do like back workers in a very big way. Um, sometimes uh you know sometimes ethically and sometimes unethically just like employers are sometimes ethical and sometimes unethical um yeah. but they are forces to be reckoned with one way or the other um okay. and that said um you know uh i want to let uh uh okay. ellis speak because i think she has an announcement because we're at about the time where she asks the introverts to speak up so ellis go ahead okay, okay thank you hi i hope my um Sound is fixed. Yep. Uh, anyone who hasn't spoken yet, now's the time to raise your hand. Um, and also, I'll just um, in the chat, I put uh, information about our membership and the Freethinker Institute official website if you'd like to find out about the five intentions. Um, it's free to join, um, and we'd love to have you. Um, and upcoming events, um, just so that you all hear before you uh, take off for today, um, the 28th will be. The case for reincarnation. Uh, Garrett will be hosting that. On the seventh, um, I have my friend Garrett Jackson um, doing a shamanic journey for us, uh, where we can participate and find our power animals. And on the fourteenth, back to politics. Uh, why did Trump get elected? I know 
that's the announcement Sean was waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks. And that's one of the essays I alluded to earlier um, that I've written um, about the subject, the, that subject, which has come up a couple of times. That said, I want to let Jeff, Jeff go. Go ahead, Jeff. Good to see you. Hey, Garrett. Good hey. Lord, what what a what a what a wonderful uh, and amazing product here. So thank you so much for all the research and uh, and thinking and um, and actually putting it down on paper. Um, it really is very impressive. Um, I, I say that because I'm because I'm about to offer you a few things. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. But but it is a remarkable effort um, and work in progress. So um, I, I'm 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 just I'm not going to take long here. Just got a couple of things. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I just want to let you know over over the last three decades, I've um, designed and delivered very intensive week-long and multi-week-long leadership programs for over 21,000 people around the world. And so a little bit of this comes from lessons learned in that process. You know, the, the School of Hard Knocks has, a, has an expensive tuition, so you might as well learn something from it. Um, the, so first of all, um, why, why are these traits because in my experience, I'm not talking necessarily about the formal definition, traits kind of connotes um, genetic. It, whereas, uh, and again, I'm not necessarily looking at the strict definition, but characteristics tends to um, connote things that are acquired. Um, and so I'm not sure why um, you use the word traits, probably because you think of them as kind of the same thing as characteristics and, and a lot of people use them inter interchangeably. But um, I, rather than you asking you to explain it, I'd like to offer you that characteristics might be a better word than traits because yeah. of the common, you know, there's, there's a question, there's this big question about, you know, are leaders born or grown and, um, since that's such a significant question, traits might not be the best word. So I agree that's with a, you, and it's already a, a suggestion. In the document. <laughs> so, so next, um, I'm going to ask you a trick question. Yeah. Okay, and just answer however you wish because it doesn't really matter. Which of these characteristics is the most important one? The first one. Just whatever, whatever yeah. comes to mind. For me, the first one. I I did put them in priority order, so. But I would argue that integrity for integrity should come first. Um, and so um, well, the first one is create a shared vision for the group and communicate yeah. that vision with the organization. Yeah, but so I, that's that's the first one. It is. But um, but I would argue that um, you know, so it's it's, integrity... so it's, a, it, it's, a, it's okay. It's a trick question. Yeah. So so it doesn't matter what you answered. It's a okay. but thank you. Thank you for your answer. Sure. My my considered opinion is that there isn't one. Um, it's sort of like asking, which is more important, freedom or responsibility? Mm -hmm. So the obvious answer to that is, well, they're both important. And they're actually important in relationship to each other. For example, right. respons it's responsibility that makes freedom possible. Yeah. And yet all responsibility and no freedom would be certain death. So these two things are related. And they exist in a, in a, in a balance, and um, and the what they what what that point begs is this: is that um, these uh, all of these values and characteristics um, uh, are are a they are answers to questions. And the statements without the underlying questions um, is not quite as meaningful. Um, second, that they are um, they are also leadership is is in some ways um, situational. 
and, and I don't mean situational just in, in the in the in the you know the the formal definition of the of the philosophy of situational leadership. I mean that that leadership happens in a context. And so the difficulty with 32 points with no context is that they sort of go along and you know, and as, as if everyone applies in every situation and everyone is, you know, so for example, it is positional leadership sometimes really important or is democratic leadership um, sometimes really important? Um, and is there a possibility that they're both important in relationship to each other? And maybe neither of them is the right answer in every single context. And therefore, you know, leadership by individuals, you know, who are, who are, you know, the buck stops here. Maybe that's important in some contexts. Leadership according to some sort of democratic orientation where people vote, or maybe there's a consensus, which I would warn you against as a word, because it's kind of a dangerous situation where anybody has the authority to be able to block anything. So context is not quite as, I mean, consensus is not quite as wonderful as people imagine. Uh, which neither is democracy, but just because a, a majority of people vote for something doesn't mean it's ethical or right. And so this is a complex, this is a complex thing. But at the very least, to say um, positional versus democratic orientations to leadership and decision making and responsibility and accountability, one way to help figure them out is to put them in context. So, for example. A military unit might be different from a family and might be different from a school and might be different from a sports team. These are different contexts and cultures and goals and membership requirements and all kinds of things. And so leadership to some extent happens in, in, in contexts. Um, and last, um, one great diagram. And actually, um, in some ways, diagrams are almost more useful than a list uh, for portraying these kinds of things, because diagrams allow you to see something in the whole, whereas a list is sort of, a you know, like this is sort of, you know, 32 kind of unrelated things, um, which you could be, le be led to think they might be linear, but they not, might not be. They might be all at the same time, you know, in different contexts. So I'll offer you a little diagram. It's very simple. It's, a, it's, it's just a concentric circles diagram. So if you put an individual in the middle, in the smallest circle, and then in the next ring around that individual, you put a team or a group. Uh, in my experience, it's usually teams and folks that I'm working with. And then in the next concentric circle kind of organization, you know, that the, um, you know, the team is kind of responsible for relating to the rest of the organization. Um, sometimes in a team of teams where there's a whole bunch of teams and, you know, these folks from the closest in team go out and, and uh, are the are key people with regard to a whole bunch of teams. But we'll keep it simple here, that there's, a, there's an individual, there's a team, there's an organization. Um, outside of the organization, what one, what one might call kind of external stakeholders, which could be everything from investors, to customers, to regulators, to, you know, a whole bunch of different things that are not necessarily inside to the organization, but they're, they're important, these external stakeholders. And then beyond those external stakeholders, just to keep it simple, there's the world. So an individual, a team, an organization, external stakeholders who are directly related to the organization, and then keeping it adequately simple, the world. Those are different, all, those are all, that's also a way to see different contexts. And if, um, if you were to organize these 32, and, and, and it might even end up being yeah. like 64. Um, maybe you could continue. Um, of course, uh, in the no set, worries. Next comment, but that sounds wonderful, thank you. No worries. It's just um, you ask questions about each concentric circle to which these things are answers. And that and that helps. 
to sort of organize it. All done. Yeah. So, so Jeff, I guess, um, you know, um, I'd be curious to know like a specific example of a perspective of leadership. You mentioned positional versus democratic leadership, a perspective of leadership that does not align with the priority order of, of characteristics. Now we're calling them not traits because I agree with you. Characteristics is a better word. Um, trait does not by dictionary definition, as you alluded to mean, you know, set in stone, but it, it has the implication socially. And so I think characteristics is better. Um, it's definition number two. Definition number one is right. Is right. Definition number two is genetic. Yeah, it just avoids confusion to say characteristics. That's more what I meant. I just didn't have good word choice there. I just wrote right. something down quickly. So um, appreciate that feedback and action taken. Um, as far as consensus, having one person be able to block things, that's actually not the case. Like consensus just means a majority of opinion. And so even if a leader has a majority opinion of his, his or her team, you know, saying something, that's enough to take action on because, you know, if there's one person disagreeing, you can say, look, you know, the majority of people agree with this, you know, we're going to have to move forward at some point. We can't necessarily get consent, like uh, unanimity, which is what you're talking about on everything. So even though I said I often get unanimity, you know, there have definitely been times where in my company, we had consensus, but not unanimity. And I said, look, we have a majority opinion. I get that two or three people don't agree with this, but the rest of us are all on the same page. And, you know, we can't continue to talk about it. We've all heard each other's perspective and we've convinced as many people as we can. And now we're going to move forward with consensus rather than unanimity. So well, Garrett, are... Garrett, what I would offer, some, offer you is that the definition of consensus, at least as I've used it in facilitating team decisions, is without strong objection. That's the difference between, you know, uh, unanimity and consensus. They mean different things. And so I'm not sure if that's the dictionary definition, it's not. but the difference, yeah. but the, but the difference between, you know, you have majority and you have uh, unanimity. And in between that is consensus, which generally we've used to mean nobody has really strong objection. Like we can all kind of go forward and say, yeah, this is good enough. We didn't get exactly what you want, but none of us disagree strongly. And so yeah. it does sort of put veto power. Um, it does give veto power to, right. to everybody on the team. And so I'm not sure if that's the dictionary definition, it's but not, it is, yeah. but it is the but it is the group work definition. Right. No, I get it. And I, I definitely see where you're coming from. And I think it's a semantic discussion at that point because. By your definition, I would agree with you. That's not the way that I meant consensus. I meant it more in the dictionary right. term, which means a majority opinion. Um, and so, you see, but like, then, but then you're back to majority. Then you're back to voting. See, well, so it's not really a me? vote because if you've given everybody a voice to speak their opinion, right? You've given everybody the voice to say why they believe something should be true or should not be true. And you've given out, you've empowered everybody to express their opinion openly in a place of psychological safety. And if you've done that, then you've gotten all of the opinions on the table and everybody's been able to form a judgment with an open mind as to which opinions to follow the most. And if at that point you have a, a majority agreement, then it's not simply a vote, it's a well-informed vote. And a well-informed vote is a much different thing than just a blind vote. And so I would argue a well-informed vote is what we should be striving for. We're never going to get unanimity on everything. We can't even get unanimity that the world is an oblate spheroid. You know, if we stopped all, you know, payments for everything and stopped all farming because we can't come to consensus that Earth is an oblate spheroid, we would all starve to death, right? So, so we're never going to get... Uh, we can we can talk about this another day, the fine, yeah. finer points. I can just tell you, I've been involved in a lot of situations where everybody got to speak their mind and everybody was informed and there was no consensus. So just, just for, you know, I, can, I, I believe you. It just, by it experience, hasn't, I can yeah. tell you, it doesn't necessarily happen. I believe you. It's, it's, it just hasn't it's been informed the case disagreement. Like my experience, <laughs> you know, running my company for five years this way, you know, for the people that, the people that, um, you know, follow my company culture, which is, you know, you know, on my website at playrate.com slash careers, you know, we, we generally have, you know, almost always unanimity or consensus for sure. Um, that's our five minute warning. 
Um, and so, um, I, but I agree with you, Jeff, but then what I would challenge you, Jeff, is what's the better way forward and think more about that and bring it up in the online community because, you know, short of giving everybody a voice and moving forward with consensus, you're never going to convince everybody of everything. And that's my point about if we stopped farming until everybody had consensus, you know, like unanimity on whether or not Earth was an oblate spheroid, we would all starve to death. That's not a good path forward either. And so we eventually have to, you know, let everyone speak their their perspective and then move forward. And so that's all I'm saying is that we should leave space for everyone to speak their perspective and then move forward once the majority has spoken at, in a well-informed way. Does that make sense? No, but it's okay. It's all right. Don't worry about it. We can, Doesn't we make can sense talk about to it you, another but time. I, I'm curious. If it I, makes I, I, I understand what you're can, saying. They can judge I, 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 understand, yeah. I understand what you're saying. Uh, I've been involved in a lot of situations over the last 35 years. And, and the definitions have to be slightly different in order to cope with the realities that are there. But, uh, but, I, but I appreciate your, your effort to, to create that and to define it that way. And it's all, it's all good. I, I appreciate it and respect it. But it would, it would be a slightly longer conversation with some other examples, but no, no worries. No problem. We're almost out of time. So we don't have time for that now. But if you want to talk about yeah. it in the online community, I welcome the conversation. Great. So Great. Uh, Harry, go ahead. Actually, if you, uh, Harry, if you don't mind, I want to let Darlene go because we're almost at the end of our time, but then I'll let you go right after her. Is that okay? It's fine. Because she hasn't spoken yet. So Darlene, we'd love to hear from you. Good to see you again. Mine is short. I'm doing a plug for education. Um, you know, uh, regardless of whether we're talking about, you know, who the leader is at our local grocery store, the local warehouse, or some sort of local political position or national political position. Uh, you know, if if a larger percentage of the population would, you know, if all, all of us adults would occasionally go to college and maybe retake the basics, take some advanced learning, then when we are being leaders, we'll be we'll do a better job, and we will also we'll be more informed, and then we'll. Uh, expect more of our officials. We'll expect them to be educated also if we're at more. Oh, I think we lost Eileen. All right, Harry, I'm going to say we'll let her speak when she comes back. Um, oh, wait, here, here, here's Eileen. Eileen, we lost you. Uh, do you hear me? We lost uh, okay. you. I was you got basically disconnected. Saying okay, I was basically just saying if everybody was educated, it would be better. Like our political leaders, they didn't allow for irradiated food because they were afraid that the food would have radiation. And that's like thinking that microwave food has radiation because they had just poor knowledge of science that they voted something out that would help the poor have more food. So if there's, a, there are practical, there are a lot of practical needs that would be better met for a t an, our entire population and for the entire world if everybody would just occasionally take one or two classes all the time. Um, and, and if we just made time in our schedules, a lot of us could do it. And I'm just putting a plug in for education. And you know, if you don't feel like you need to learn anything, then take an art class, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, or art history or anything. Anyway, but I'm I think that's a great plug, Darlene. And that's why some politicians are arguing for free higher education so that it will be more accessible, that education um, to more people, which, you know, I, I think would be great if we could have more accessible education, because I wish more people would um, take lifelong learning as a pursuit. Um, yes, which is part of yeah, what, basic education should be free, yes. Yeah, yep. and that's part of what the Free Thinker Institute is about, is like creating, you know, adult education for things not taught in academia or industry, at least not taught widely in academia or industry. Um, so that's that's why we're here is to to help people learn about those things. So that said, I want to let Harry go. OK, just real quick. Uh, I thought the comment about finding politicians that are willing to admit they made a mistake is brilliant. Um, that I think that's like finding a needle in a haystack. But, you know, I suppose it is. I suppose it is possible. And the other comment was that 
the, you know, the, the, the comment I made about organizational structure, you know, make sure you have qualified people working under you. In, in of course, your context, you want to make sure that your educational structure has the same ethical sort of um, ideas and leadership ideas that, that the leader of the overall organization has, right? right. So that those things flow down. Right yep. in into that into the organization. So yeah, that's all. Those are great points, Harry. And in fact, every every team member that I interview, I introduce to my company's culture, and I say, look, if this culture is not a fit for you, this company may not be a fit. I haven't had anyone say that it wasn't, but I have had a few people within a few weeks be very clear that they said, I'm the boss of this function, and I'm going to be the decision maker, and I'm not going to listen to my team members because I'm the boss and they need to listen to me. And I said, look, you know, this isn't the play rate culture. And, you know, I think it makes more sense for us to part ways, even though I really needed a senior person in that space, it wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth sacrificing the culture. And the fact is in that situation, I actually agreed with their team member more than them. And so, you know, like, what can I say? But, you know, people who are ego driven and don't admit their flaws, you know, are the most flawed people on earth because they don't admit their flaws. <laughs> so they're just as flawed as the days that they started thinking they were perfect. And that's why I say I don't hire perfect people at play rate. Um, and that said, um, you're you're right that even when I when I made the comment about finding politicians that admit they're wrong, I was trying to think about the ones that I really like, which are very few. And when they admitted they were wrong, and I actually couldn't come up with examples. So um, I don't know if any do, um, but you know, I would, I would guess that some probably do. Um, and, you know, I, I haven't like researched for that, but it's something that I want to try to try to scour the internet for us chat GPT. That said, uh, I'm going to let Darlene go and then we're going to kind of close out for the evening. Did you not mean to have your hand up, Darlene? No. Okay. So no, I meant um, to put it down. <laughs> okay. No worries. Um, so look, I just want to thank everybody for coming for the really interesting questions, thoughtful contributions um, for everybody's perspectives. Thank you all for sharing and for, for showing up and for teaching and learning together. Um, that's what this is all about is teaching and learning from each other together. So um, really appreciate everybody participating in that. And uh, thank you all for coming. Hope to see you uh, as many of you as who can make it in future events and next week. And um, I, I hope you all have a great rest of your week and I hope to see many of you in the online community. Um, so feel free to uh, feel free to jump in there and start chatting about whatever is of interest to you. We got an interesting uh, topic is tax policy. I think that's a really interesting one for us to talk about another uh, another week. So we'll add that to the agenda somewhere. Um, and we have a lot of good uh, events coming up. So thanks again, everybody. Hope you all have a great rest of your night. And uh, yeah. thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a terrific day, everyone.